Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Infinity Church. Glad to have you with us this morning at Infinity. In all we do, we seek to applaud God, abide in Jesus Christ, and advance His kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're thankful for the chance to do that with you uh, here today. We've had a really good start to our fall with our midweek ministries. And so we hope if you're not already plugged in, you'll come join our men's, women's, students, or kids groups uh, on Wednesday nights at 630 but if you're not, if that time doesn't work for you, there's a few other discipleship groups happening midweek. So uh, if you want to be a part of one and Wednesdays doesn't work, let us know and we'd love to plug you in uh, somewhere. Hey, I want to let you know about a couple events upcoming. Uh, one is that uh, we're going back to Stewart Farms on October 6th. It's a Friday night. Uh, we had a really big turnout at this. This was a lot of fun last year. Uh, and so we contacted them and reserved this again this year. Um, I told Nathan, so Nathan made the image on the left. I put the details on the right that don't look fancy. So Nathan's going to make this look better probably by next week. But this is functional. You can read it, right? So this is what I needed to tell you, and this is my notes to myself. It starts at 5. So Stewart Farms is an entry if you haven't been there. A uh, really cool place. And so uh, we have a big picnic shelter thing, picnic area, not shelter, picnic area reserved. Uh, we've got, we're, we're going to provide the meat. And then we'd love for you to bring a cider dessert to share. And then they've given us a group rate, but then we want to make sure it is um, affordable for everybody. And so this is the real simple way we've broken down the cost. $5 wagon ride, $5 corn maze, corn maze per person. Or if you've got a bunch of kids like some of us, uh, here's, your, here's your family max contribution. That way it just keeps it easy and affordable for everybody uh, in that night. But a good time to be together. Good time. They, uh, they do a bonfire for us. We'll do s'mores. It'll be a lot of fun. So hope you'll plan to join us that Friday evening, October 6th at the farm. Uh, in just a few weeks, the week before that, on Sunday, uh, September 24th, we are going to do a baptism service. And so we uh, just like to announce this ahead of time a few weeks in case there are a few people that we haven't already talked to that would like to be baptized or have questions about that. And so we'd love to talk with you if that's something the Lord is putting on your heart. Uh, this is how the Lord calls us to follow Him in obedience after he has saved us. And so if you have not been baptized and you're interested, please come see us. And we'd love to talk to you about that for the 24th or sometime in the future. Uh, at the end of our service today, we're going to pray over Chad Spain and invite his family forward to do that with them because Chad <laughs> is headed to Ukraine tomorrow. Uh, a number of you know that uh, we have been, we have a ministry partner in Ukraine, uh, uh, Sasha is Alina's dad and his wife, and they, they had a huge ministry that they do in Ukraine. They had to come. They were here for a while. You maybe met them while they were in Fountain Inn. They have gone back uh, to Ukraine, and we are helping send a team, uh, Chad and a number of others from a few other churches that are going all the way to Ukraine, which is incredible, uh, and all the logistics that that's going to take to make possible. So we want to really pray over them and encourage Chad uh, in that process and be praying for them for the next 10 days or so after that. Uh, because it's a great opportunity. So I want to let you know about that and encourage you to be praying for Chad and their team uh, in the week ahead. As we begin our service today, we're going to do our memory verse. So I invite you to stand and we're going to read Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Let's read this together. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the blessing of gathering us here once again to praise you and to in delight in you. God, it's a, a privilege to know you, a privilege uh, to just enjoy your presence and enjoy uh, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. God, thank you for those that you've gathered here. May this time that we serve together honor and glorify you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Let's pray. Father, we praise your name and thank you this morning for who you are, that you are faithful throughout all generations, and your word is truth. We thank you that you never change and you never will. We thank you, as the psalmist says, because you are unchanging, the children of your servants can dwell secure. We thank you that because you do not change, we are secure in you. And that when Jesus said, it is finished, it is still finished today. And we can trust in you. We take this time to, to worship you for who you are. Help us this morning as your church to praise your name, to worship you. And through this worship, change our hearts. You are unchanging and you change us. So change us now, Lord. Conform us to your image. In Christ's name. I 
sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders inside. But you're still the same. Your goodness is good without it, and you'll never change. I will tell them your wonder, sing them your grace. God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday. Children are dismissed. As our children are making their way out, you can remain standing. We're going to read Psalm 102. Our kids up through third grade, you're welcome to make your way to your Kidfinity U class today. We're going to read from Psalm 102, verses 25 to 28. So you can follow along on the screen or your own copy of God's Word. But let's hear. God's word together today. Psalm 102, 25 says this, Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, and you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be, shall be established before you. You can be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for uh, the testimony of your word and how you have proclaimed your nature, your character, who you are to us. Father, it's a blessing uh, to know you and be known by you. We pray that even now as we hear your word expounded, that we all the more would see how great you are. And then as we see you, we would trust in you all the more. I ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. I, uh, I think when it comes to change, we have a love-hate 
relationship with change. There are certain things about change we really like and certain things about change that we really don't like. For example, I think some of us enjoy how seasons change. We enjoy the, the coming cooler weather and enjoy fall and the start to that. We don't really love it when that gets really, really cold and last Christmas Eve freezes a lot of our pipes and we have struggles because of that. We really like the warm spring days and the change that that brings, but we can't stand the change when it gets so hot like it was a few weeks ago that we can't stand to be outside. We love the change we see in our kids when they get older and mature and they, they learn new things and they grow and they develop as people. We so much are, are, are just satisfied by it. It's, it's enjoyable to see our kids grow up. And yet at the same time, we, we hate to lose any passing moment and sometimes feel like time moves too quickly as our kids get older. We, we love how technology, as it develops, it affords us the ability to do some things that we couldn't otherwise do and be able to you know, research all kinds of things from this little microcomputer we carry around in our pockets and take pictures instantaneously, send them all over the place. Those are all really cool things we love about technology. But we hate how technology moves so fast that it seems like our software on all of our devices updates all the time and we have to relearn how to do the things we thought we already knew how to do because it all updated and changed and left us in the dust. Our world changes so quickly. I mean, just think about the, how much life is different since the year 2000. That's not that long ago. That's this century. And yet 9-11 hadn't happened yet. Tomorrow's the 23rd anniversary of the attacks on 9-11. That was just 23 year, 22 years ago. This, this last week, I listened to a sermon given uh, in New York City that week, like the week after 9-11 had happened. And as I was just listening to that, I was thinking about all the people listening to that sermon, just like we were, wherever you were at that point. We just had no idea all the changes that that attack would bring to our world. Countless other things have altered since that time, even just in that decade. Some things that seem maybe trivial or silly, but make a big impact. YouTube was founded in 2005. That was, can you, can you, I know you can, but world, the world without YouTube was a different world, right? Google became a verb in 2006 into the dictionary. That wasn't that long ago, and the world, you know, it's hard to remember that. Facebook also in 2006 became available to more than just college students. It was before then that was available, but to all of us, it became available, and social media kind of became mainstream 2006. And then the major inflection point in technology that all of history is going to look back to is in 2007 when the iPhone was first announced. That was not that long ago. And how dramatically different our world is because of that advancement in technology or regression, depending on how you look at it. I don't know. 2008, a year later, they, Apple launched something called an App Store and boasted of how, how there are 500 apps you could download to put on your phone, including things like turning this new touchscreen phone that everybody wasn't sure about, you could turn it into to where it makes sounds like a lightsaber. Wow, it's amazing. For reference, in 2002, across Apple and Google app stores, over 9 million apps available, and even more impressive to me, or discouraging, depending on how you look at it, uh, is that those apps generated almost $460 billion of revenue, just the apps that we put on our devices. Our world changes really, really fast. It is rapidly changing, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worst. And it seems like the only thing constant is change, right? It's progressing constantly. And I think we have this love-hate relationship with change because of kind of two competing desires in our hearts. We, we have a, a desire and a longing for stability, do we not? We are creatures of habit to some degree or another. We, we appreciate and we want certain stable levels of routine and environments and people and things that are predictable because we, we can thrive and flourish in stability. And, and when we don't have that stability, and we see this, studies show this, especially as young kids, if there are not certain levels of stability, there is major trauma that happens to us biologically that affects us. We all need a certain level of stability, a certain level of things that don't change. And at the very same time, there are things that we really want to change or really would love if they would change. Things about us, things about other people, things about 
our personality or circumstances, whatever else it may be. We need some. We want some things to change. Why is that? We have these competing desires, love, hate, relationship. And surely part of that is a result of being in a broken world, the sin of the world, and the way that it has messed things up, leaves us longing for things to change in a certain way. But I think it goes even back further than that. I think that our, desire, our kind of mixed emotions about change go all the way back to creation. God himself is unchanging. Our memory verse for the month, Malachi 3.6 I, the Lord, do not change. And yet, at the beginning, what's the first thing he did? The unchanging one changed things by creating the world. And he created Adam and Eve in such a way that from the beginning, they would be people who change. They had to eat. That's change. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. That's change. He created them as changing beings. The unchanging one created a changing creation. And even before sin entered, he intended for it to be changing. Why is that? I'm sure it's far beyond what I could comprehend, but at least one reason, I think, in our design is that we were created to grow. Not just physically, but developmentally and maturity and grow in our knowledge of God. We have been studying God's attributes and we have said that God is infinite so we can literally spend the rest of eternity growing to know God more. And there is a deep joy and delight in knowing Him better today than we did yesterday. That is a, a privilege, a, a, a gift that God has given us. He has created us to be people who grow and change. So whether we're, whatever else we're studying about God this fall, we can study and know that He has created us to know Him better. And that is a gift. Today, the attribute we want to meditate on is that God is unchangeable. And we praise Him for that. Again, all these, as you've been along with us, a lot of these attributes have a little more complicated words. So just in case you're reading, that is, the theologians will refer to this as God being immutable, unable to change, immutable. So we praise God that He is unchanging. In the same breath, I want to invite you to the good news that we are changeable and we are changing. God is unchanging, and we are changeable. And this morning, I want to invite you to trust that God to change you. The, uh, trust the unchangeable God to change you. Psalm 102, we just read, says, Of old you laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens are the works of your hands. So God created it all, right? We believe that. Verse 26, They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment, you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same. God's Word says that everything changes, including heavens and earth. And compared to God, the very earth being changed is as simple for Him as taking off one jacket and putting on another. <laughs> because God is unchanging. He does not change. We, on the other hand, are not just, uh, it's not just that we can change, we are commanded to to change. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Command. We're called to be people who change. How do we change? What happens in us? We, we want to be people of love and joy and peace, right? All kinds of other good things. How do those things happen? Those are from Galatians 5, 22, fruits of the Spirit, God Himself in us, changing us. God is unchangeable. He invites us to change and He empowers us with His Spirit to be people who change. Trust the unchangeable God to change you. So this fall, as we continue to meditate on who, who God is, I, I invite you to fix your eyes on Him. Know Him better. Let, as, you, as you come to see Him, as you come to know Him better, He changes us and He transforms us, even as Nathan prayed a moment ago, to be conformed to the image of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. He invites us to change, to become more like him. I, I want to meditate with you for a moment on what it means for God to be unchanging and unchangeable. And uh, there are, you could make literally an infinite list here, but I'm just giving you three uh, as your first blank here. God is unchanging in his character, his word, and his purposes. God is unchanging in his character, his word, and his purposes. We already read Malachi 3.6, for I, the Lord, do not change. James 1.17 
For every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He doesn't, doesn't have a variable. He doesn't lean this way or that way. He doesn't create a shadow. He doesn't change. And this applies to all three persons of the Trinity, including Christ, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging in His very character, His nature, the very essence of who He is. That matches what we've said so far, right? If God is infinite, God is eternal, then, then He can't change because we said God is outside of time, right? He created time. He acts within time. But he himself is not bound by it. So if he's not bound by time, when would he change? <laughs> he's always been, he's looking at time from the outside. There's time, change is something that happens for us within time. But if God's outside of it, he, there's no place for him to change. See what I mean? That's odd. All right. If God is, if God is not just uh, an infinite and eternal, we saw last week, he is self-existent and self-sustaining. He has no needs. To change would require or, or imply some kind of like he, he needs something, then he got it. He was hungry, then he's full or vice versa. Th those are changes. But God doesn't need anything, so he, he doesn't change. He is immutable. He is perfect. Uh, he is at very, his very essence, he's, he's, he's completely and fully all the things that he is. He is fully holy. He is completely loving. He is completely gracious. None of those things gets better or worse. He is perfect in his very being psalm 1830 this god his way is perfect the word of the lord proves true he's a shield for all those who take refuge in him or jesus command in matthew 5 48 you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect you know how perfect works right you can't be more perfect or more perfecter right you're either perfect or not it's either yes or no if god is perfect he can't grow less or more of that right he is completely perfect which means he can't go up or down. If he was changing, that would mean he's either getting better or worse. And he doesn't do that. He is perfect. All of God's attributes are unchanging, which means God has always been and will always be perfectly righteous and just, while at the same time in his grand, mysterious being also being amazingly, perfectly gracious and merciful. God holds those things together perfectly because he's perfect and unchanging changing. God's power doesn't change. He doesn't run out of strength. He doesn't grow weary or faint-hearted. God is omnipresent. We talked about that already, that he's, there's no, you can't get somewhere he's not, right? He's everywhere. That never changes. He has all knowledge. He doesn't stop knowing things or forget things. He is unchanging. Nothing's never, ever going to happen that God didn't see coming or plan. He is in charge of it all. God in His very nature, His very character, He is unchanging. Now, this does not mean God is some kind of statue, like He is static and doesn't act within time. No, if anything, when we describe God being unchanging, we're saying He is perfectly and fully active within creation. So I know this may, might start to get to the mind-bending part of this one, but He is perfectly and fully active. He's fully involved in everything. He, there has never been a time that he was not involved in something fully and completely. And that way he is unchanging. He's unchanging in his character, which means he's also unchanging in his word, which is the truth. Unchanging in character and unchanging in his word. Isaiah 40, 7 and 8. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fades, but the word of our God will stand forever forever. Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. His word is rock solid. It is fixed. It is not changing. Psalm 19, 7, the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. All right, I said perfect, unchanging. He is the Bible. God's word is unchanging because God himself is the word and is unchanging. So yes, God revealed his word to us over time, 66 books by a couple dozen authors, right? Spread out over thousands of years. So it, it came to us in the sense that it, it changed in the sense that we did. It wasn't written down. Now it's written down. But the truth of it, the essence of it is God himself. And that is unchanging. God's truth, God's reality 
is unchanging. And I'll tell you, if there's anything counterculture I've said so far, it's this. Truth is not changing. We live in a pluralistic society that says all truth is relative. You can believe what you want. I'll believe what I want. And we can just all get along. And there are all these different religions or different ideologies are just different paths to try to live out human satisfaction. And that's not true. That's not true. We even have this phrase. I, I don't even know how this, like, people don't hear this as a, uh, you know, paradox. It doesn't make sense. They say things like, here's my truth. Or she's just speaking her truth. Or he's speaking his truth. That, you, you see how that doesn't hold up? Just like something is either perfect or it's not. It's either true or it's not. Just because it's mine or yours, it, it doesn't, like, it's true or it's not. What we mean is, this is my perspective or my opinion. And that's a valid thing. If an event happens and multiple people see it, they have different perspectives. That's okay. But the truth is still the truth. It's not my truth. It's just the truth or it's false. We don't live in a world. Praise God he created the world that it's not like you know, alternate universes happening at the same time. Different perspectives, of course. But there is one truth. And supremely, there is one truth with a capital T. His name is Jesus. When he said, I am the way, the truth. And the life. God's, God is unchanging in his word, the truth, and we need that foundation. More than ever, our culture misses that. God is unchanging in his word, the truth. There have been times, plenty of times, when significant percentages of people have misunderstood the truth, even as they've read in scripture. For unfortunately, a long time, a big percentage of people defended the evil of slavery from the Bible. It doesn't make the Bible wrong. It makes the people wrong. Similarly, people defended, used the Bible to say, no, the sun goes around the earth. Not, wait, they said the earth goes, no, they said the other way. They said the earth was the middle and the sun was going around, right? And we know it's not that way. The Bible doesn't contradict that. Like, we just read it wrong. Truth didn't change. People were wrong. The truth of God's word is unchanging. And if God's character is unchanging and his word is unchanging, third one I want to give you is that his purposes are unchanging. Now, that's a big topic we'll get back to when we come to God being all-knowing and all-powerful and sovereign. But suffice it for now, I think it's important to, to see how this fits together. If God's nature is changing, as, as is unchanging, so are his plans. The same plans he made from the foundation of the world are, are never going to change. He isn't going to get to some point in history and go, you know what? Actually, plan B, let's go to that one, right? He has had the same plan from the beginning in his eternal nature and is never going to change his plans. And nothing and no one can stop his plans from happening. Praise God. Psalm 33, 10, 11, the Lord brings the counsel of nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. You hear that? All these nations are getting together, making a plan. And God can just squish them and say, no, no, this was my plan. And we're sticking with that one. Isaiah 49, 46, 9 and 10. I am God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things yet not, not done. My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. You hear that? God declares the end from the beginning. He's already said it. It's already finished. It's already done. He has already accomplished it. His plan will come to pass. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. He has, has he said and will he not do it or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? We have already referenced Romans 12 speaks of God's good, pleasing and perfect will. To change something implies getting better or worse. And God does not have a plan that's getting better or worse. It's his perfect plan, his perfect will, and it will be accomplished. God doesn't, to, to change God's mind would mean that we give him some information that he didn't already have. And that doesn't happen. If he knows all things perfectly, he's going to make the perfectly wise decision in every situation. And you can't tell him something he didn't already know to add something and change his mind. Right? God is all wise, all powerful, and his plans never change. 
He has always been perfect, and he always will be perfect. Nobody has more power than him that can change him. Nobody has, uh, uh, can manipulate him or bribe him. He declares the end from the beginning. And I already know all the questions that are coming up in your head, and we'll deal with them another day, <laughs> right? There's a lot there, I know. But let's just rest in the good, awesome privilege of an unchanging God. It is a great comfort and a great assurance that God is unchanging because that's the only way we can trust him. If God could change, our faith would at best be blind in him. At best, we could say, I can look back in history to the things you've already revealed, and this is how good you've been so far, but I have no guarantee about tomorrow because I haven't been there. And if you want to change God, sure, you can change, but I, I guess I'll trust you because i got no better options. But that's about as good as we could do. But because God is unchanging, I, the Lord, will not change. We can rest assured. We can have 100% confidence in who he is. Not because of some knowledge we created, because he gave it to us. And he said, this is who I am. You can trust in me. If God would cha could change, we could have no assurance of anything in the future. But God did not leave us a wishy-washy uh, plan or idea of him. He gave us a firm foundation. One of the most common metaphors, especially through the Psalms, is they call God a rock. Psalm 62, he only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. He is the foundation beneath your feet. He is the rock solid truth no matter what storm is coming. Over and over again throughout the word, we read, your steadfast love endures forever. Your steadfast love endures forever. You see how if God could change, we couldn't proclaim that. We could say your steadfast love has endured for as long as there's been time, but we'd have no guarantee about the future. But because God doesn't change, we can rest on the truth of his love that his steadfast love never changes. The truth is de this truth is dependent upon God being unchanging. If God could change, we would have no way to claim that his love endures. God's type of love, his unchanging, unconditional love, is a glorious comfort and good news to us. Now, with all these attributes, as true as they are, you can have all kinds of questions and struggles. Sometimes there are objections from within Scripture themselves. What, what are we, how do we make all the passages fit together? How do we see how this works? So I'll just give you a couple, because I know there's a few. Um, common, common questions, things like, how come when we come to the Bible and I read about God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they look different? You, 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 you ever had that question? Or people ever ask you that question? That's a common objection. And the reality is we just haven't read the Bible thoroughly enough if we think God is different in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. It's the same God. This is one true eternal God who has always been the same and always will be the same. People criticize the God of the Old Testament for his wrath and then celebrate Jesus' mercy in the New Testament as if these were two different gods and say, I'm just going to pick the New Testament God and just chop off the first two-thirds of my Bible and just hang out with Jesus, right? Keep reading. Like, just read it in depth a little bit more, right? The one true triune God in the Old Testament told Moses in Exodus 32, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious and slow to anger. Praise God, that's who he is. And the Jesus that you love and should love warned us in places like, uh, a couple places in the, in the Gospels, Matthew and, and Luke for sure. Jesus said, it's better to have a super heavy millstone hung around your neck and dropped in a sea than to make one of his children sin. There's your, there's your lovey-dovey Jesus, right? The same God who is perfectly holy and righteous and hates sin and has been perfectly merciful and gracious from all time is the same God in the Old and New Testament. The Ten Commandments themselves, people come to that thinking this is just law and God being, you know, wrathful and whatever else it may be. How did the Ten Commandments start in Exodus 20? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Do you know what that is? That says, I saved you by grace. This is what the Ten Commandments start with. 
They start with the declaration of God's salvation apart from your works. And now that you have been created a people and redeemed out of slavery on no, on no basis of your own merits, now that you are my people, live in such a way with me as, my, as, as the holy God. I will be your God. You'll be my people. That's, that's the Ten Commandments. And it sounds a whole lot like Ephesians 2 and the rest of the way the New Testament talks about salvation. How does the New Testament talk about salvation? You are saved. You went from being dead to alive on no merits of your own, right? Ephesians 2 says you were dead in trespasses, but God, being rich in mercy, has saved you by grace, not by your works. And now that you have been saved, Ephesians 2.10, you should know that you are God's workmanship created for good works, which God planned in advance for you to do. Same God, Old Testament and New Testament. God progressively revealed to us his story. He, he could have just dropped it out of the sky, but he did it in narrative form. We all love novels. We love good movies. We love stories because God has created the world in a story. So it took some time for us to understand it, to see it all. But now that we've seen it, we say he's the same God on the first page and the last page. We change, but he doesn't. Does that convince you yet? Same God, Old Testament and New Testament. There's a handful more. I'm probably not going to go through all the other ones I want to. Oh, i got to do one more. All right, Genesis 6, 6, 1 Samuel 5, 15, 11 are places where we see the Scripture describe, describe God as grieved or some translations repent or to uh, regret. And some people come to that and say, well, oh, wait, wait, wait. You say he's unchanging, and yet God grieved or repented, regretted that he had made mankind, or he grieved or repented that he had made Saul king over, um, over the people of Israel. Or what about when he sends, okay, I told you just one more, but here you go. No, what about when he sends Jonah and says, if I, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. Go tell Nineveh I'm going to destroy them. But then he doesn't destroy Nineveh. What happened? What happened? Did God not change in all these situations? Well, take the Nineveh one. God pronounced judgment on an unrepentant city and said, I'm going to destroy you. But then something changed, and it wasn't God. They repented. And the same holy, just God who would have destroyed an un unrepentant city now does not destroy a repentant city. The thing that changed was their repentance. Same way in the story of right before the flood, 1 Samuel 15 with Saul. The thing that changed was the people got eviler. That's not a word. More evil in Genesis 5 and 6. Saul got evil, became evil. They are the ones that changed. The same holy, righteous judge acts according to the circumstances. You, you would be an unjust and evil person if you acted exactly the same way, no matter what was going on. Whether your kids said thank you or whether they punched you in the face when you gave them supper, you should act differently, right? It's not that you are different. It's that you're acting different according to the situation. Okay, I said I wasn't going to go as far, as far into that, but I did. Here we go. God doesn't change, and I think Scripture is consistent on that. Praise God, He doesn't change. And in the same breath, I want you to hear the good news that we do change. We are changeable. So far, we've been studying God's attributes that are unique to Him in ways that God is God and we are not like Him. We're not like Him. These are called his incommunicable attributes, things that are unique to God. And one of the temptations the devil wants to whisper in your ear, sometimes shout in your face, is you can be like him. You can be like God in ways that we were not created to be. That was the temptation for Adam and Eve in the garden to be like God. And that's the same temptation we face. It's a lie from the devil himself to believe you can't change. And here's how that may show up. A few different ways in the same, but the same temptation. One temptation is to be so defeated and discouraged and despair and saying, I'll just, I've tried and I'm just never going to change. I, I'm stuck in this rut. I'm stuck in this, hint, this sin, this addiction, this bad habit, whatever else it may be. And you, you look at yourself and you say, I, I just, I'm never going to change. And I want to free you that you aren't God. <laughs> it is good news that you are not immutable. You are not unchangeable. You and I are changeable. God alone is unchanging. Whatever habit you have, whatever 
path you've been walking down, whatever your past has been, it does not determine your future. God determines your future. God is in control of your life. He can change your heart. God can change you. Do not despair under the weight of being practicing idolatry, of making yourself God. You don't have to despair. But the same idea could be taken instead of with despair, we could bring it to God in arrogance and say, I'm never going to change. I'm stuck in my ways and I'm okay with it. As we get older, maybe especially, but anytime we could just say, this is who I am. You better deal with it. I'm not changing. You need to hear a righteous and holy God who says he alone is the one who is unchanging and we all will be changed. We will all bow the knee like it or not to King Jesus. We aren't king. Be humble before him. Don't practice idolatry. You can change and we all will eventually change. Or maybe one more angle on that same temptation is maybe instead of looking at ourselves, we're looking at somebody else, a loved one a co-worker, a boss, an employee, a public figure on TV, and we say they will never change. That person is just that way, and they're driving me crazy, but I just, I just know they're never going to change. That, too, is idolatry. They aren't God. You aren't God. God is God. Everybody is changeable. If Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, can be humbled to his knees to proclaim that God is sovereign over the universe and he is not. Everybody can change. God changes people. This is the same God we read about in Titus 3 who saved us with the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. You track what that means? Regeneration, new life. Spiritually, you had no heartbeat before Christ came in. He changes hearts. He brings new Life, the Holy Spirit it has been put inside of us and regenerates us and gives us a new life. That's transformation. That's how God changes people is by His Spirit. Jesus told us, John 16, uh, 15, 14, 15, 16, about the Holy Spirit who's going to come and teach us all things. And I already read for you Galatians chapter 5 a minute ago. He puts His Spirit inside of us, and what does He do? He bears fruit. People who did not have joy can have joy. People who did not have peace can have peace. Those are fruits of the Spirit. God changes people. You are changeable. If we can trust our unchanging God, He can change us. And according to God's unchangeable word, He will one day change us in a more glorious way than we could ever imagine. He accomplished for us something that is better than we could have ever dreamed of. And the way he did it in his incredible, mysterious ways is just mind-blowing. The unchangeable Son of God took on changeable humanity in order to change us forever. Did you track that? The unchangeable Son of God, that is God himself, the second person of the Trinity, took on a, another nature, a human nature. He took on changeable humanity. And the reason why he became human was to take people like us, humanity, humans, and change us forever. Jesus is fully God, so he does not change. The Son of God does not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in the most profound of mysteries, the unchangeable divine Son of God took on flesh. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. The unchangeable God became changeable man without losing his unchangeable godness. You got that? I know that's hard, but this is the beauty of what God did. And why did he do that? Why, why sacrifice that? Why serve that way? He did it to redeem humanity. He did it to save people, to save humans. The only way humanity could be sa saved is if humanity or, ourselves itself was redeemed. It had to be saved by a human. We needed a mediator to go between God and man. And the story of the Exodus, got one of the places where it looks like God changes is he's about to wipe out Israel after the golden calf scenario. He's about to destroy them for the face of the earth. And Moses comes before them and pleads. And God, it looks like he changes his mind. But he didn't change. 
what changed was that the people of the unholy people of Israel were unholy and then they were still unholy but they had a mediator they had somebody to go between them between God and them Moses was that mediator and he was pointing forward to what Christ would do we are still the unholy people but what has changed is we have a perfect mediator the one who is fully God and fully man and he came to earth to redeem humanity and what he accomplished for us will change us forever Christ came and he died and he resurrected and the Bible calls his resurrection the first fruits you know how you and I are going to be changed one day we will be raised with a new and glorious body you want to talk about transformation we are going to have a glorious heavenly body and all the ways you've been longing for change all the ways you've been longing to be transformed will become true in the new creation you and I will be transformed first John 3 2 beloved we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is God's work on us will be accomplished and finished once and it is finished it's done it's taken care of it is sure his plan is sure but it will be realized it will be experienced when Christ comes back and we are raised to be with him he has promised us Romans 8 28 29 that he will conform us to the image of Christ all the changes you long for they will be finished I mentioned uh, I listened this week to a sermon from the Sunday after 9-11 whatever it would have been 9 16 or so uh, from New York City I can you imagine I mean I just I, I put myself like having to preach that sermon in New York City while the smoke's probably still wafting in the air from downtown Manhattan. Tim Keller was preaching uh, while facing a whole bunch of questions. I mean, just imagine the questions that are being lobbed at pastors in New York City about God and all kinds of things. And he didn't try to answer them all, but he said, it, you know, of all the world religions, you know, I mean, I mean, this what, what they had, we had, what you had just seen on that day on 9-11 was an, an evil and unjust attack, right? An unjust attack. Whatever else was going on, this was evil and it was unjust. And Tim Keller said, of all the world religions, only Christianity tells us that the Son of God himself suffered an unjust attack. He allowed himself to be attacked without merit, without provocation, without any justice. He went through that. And why did he do that? He suffered for us, and he suffered with us. Through all the pains, all the hardships, all the things we want to change, they're not changed yet, we have a God who suffered with us. And what's astounding is that in the most evil moment of all of world history, which is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there was no, there's never been, never will be month, something more evil. And yet, God was still on his throne. In that moment, the scripture says that. Acts 2, 23, Peter tells them, You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. This is evil. And yet, he says, Jesus was delivered up, Acts 2, 23, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God even was in charge of that. And why did he do that? Acts 2, 24, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Jesus died so that he could be resurrected and so that you could be resurrected. He came and took on changeable flesh so that we could be changed once and for all in the resurrection. We are struggling in this world, suffering under the changes of, of all of our fast-moving society and a world that we just, we just want to be redeemed. And we can look to Christ and say, there it is. There's the change I need. I need a resurrection. Trust the unchangeable God to change you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace you have shown us in showing us who you are. We have not earned that at all. Father, we thank you that we get to walk with you and see, um, see the way you uh, act in our lives. What a, what a privilege it is to see the blessings you give us. Father, we confess we put ourselves in your place so often and pretend like we aren't changeable but God, we want to submit before you and plead for you to change us, plead for you to transform us. 
all the while trusting in the change that you promise will come. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this moment as we respond to you in faith. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hey, you're welcome to come pray at the altar with Nathan or me, but I pray you respond in faith as we sing together. Let's stand and sing.
Uh, I'm going to invite you to remain standing. I'm going to invite Chad and his family up here with us uh, as we're going to send them off to Ukraine. Richard and Karen, you guys can come too if you want to. Come on, come on up. Chad, uh, tell us just a little bit about how we can be praying for you and your team uh, this week as you head to Ukraine. Uh, first, we pray for my wife. She's, my kids are uh, a little wild at times, um, so I'm sure it's going to be a fun time. But um, travel is going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, it's going to take some time to get there. Uh, we don't know how long the border will take to cross. Um, it looked good this morning, but that you know that could change at any time. So travel and then... Um, much y'all know a mission trip you need to be flexible on so we don't know exactly what we're going to do when we get there we got some ideas but just pray that we need to go where we need to go and see the people we need to see and uh, be able to help and speak to them so all right sounds good how many how many on your team are going uh there's eight um five from south carolina and three from north carolina and we'll all meet up together in atlanta tomorrow and then we'll head to uh, amsterdam and to poland and then we'll get on a bus for some amount of time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, what, depending, I know that's a variable, but generally when should you be crossing the Ukraine, into Ukraine our time? You um, know? We land in Poland at about 12 o'clock their time, so it'd be about 6 o'clock here. Of which day? Of uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, so I'm hoping lunchtime. Midday on here, Tuesday. Yeah, we sh our time. Yeah, okay. We'll be crossing the border, and then I hope by dinner time, our time, I will be in Ukraine. Russia okay, speak. awesome. And then you start the return trip? Um, we come back on the 20th. Okay. So, uh, All right, perfect. All right, we'll be praying during that time. I just want to give some specifics. We'll be praying, uh, especially Tuesdays. Well, we're all the travel. Chad's a big guy. So these are a lot, a lot of small, a lot of planes and Travel's long trips. And we're praying for, for Chad for the travel. And... Uh, and then praying for God to use you while you're there. So I invite uh, the rest of y'all family, you can come put, her, put your hand on Chad and over, over Casey and the kiddos. And uh, let me lead us in a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, Chad's willingness uh, to go with this team uh, back to Ukraine. God, thank you for opening this door and uh, providing a way for this team to go and encourage and love on the people of Ukraine. God, we have been just so heartbroken uh, over all the the struggles that war has brought uh, over the last uh, year and a half almost now. And so, Lord, we pray um, that this team would be a light and uh, an encouragement to those that they encounter. God, I pray uh, for your grace to be upon them as they travel. Uh, I pray for all the difficult uh, arrangements and flights and long hours and small seats and long bus rides, uh, just for your presence to be felt in a special way uh, by Chad and the rest of their team. I pray you'll open the door for them when they get to the border, that all, that will all go smoothly. Uh, and just that as they encounter people, uh, that they would see your hand at work uh, and see the way you intend to use them and guide them uh, in that time. Lord, thank you for uh, the blessing it is to be a sending church, to be able to send uh, and encourage this team. And so I pray uh, that we would be faithful on our part uh, to love and support and to pray for them. Uh, while they go. God, I thank you for Casey and her willingness to support Chad, and I pray a special measure of grace upon her and Landon and Blake at home, and I uh, thank you for the support they have in family and friends and church and school and so many other things, uh, and I pray that you will be with them while Chad is gone. Lord, thank you for the chance to, to celebrate your work, and uh, we trust in you for all things. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>